Without further ado, this talk will be rolling out managing Kubernetes uh, with Matthew Bruchet. All right, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm here to tell you our experiences um, making production grade Kubernetes. Um, all right, so what is Kubernetes? It's an orchestration platform for application containers. Um, it can deploy, schedule, update, and scale those application containers. And I make the distinction about application containers because it's not, as Mark mentioned earlier, Lex C, Lex D containers, which we are, which we have are system containers. These are your Docker and your Rocket containers. Um, and Kubernetes really focuses on the stateless, immutable uh, web native containers, right? So they they're orchestrating those those containers. Um, with Kubernetes, we've got, uh, but again, it's not the LexD ones that Mark talked about earlier at the keynote. Um, okay, so at the heart of Kubernetes, this is really what the scheduler does. Um, Kubernetes is a declarative system. Uh, a human declares how they want the system to look, and Kubernetes works towards that end. Um, it actively manages the containers to ensure the state of the cluster eventually reaches uh, the intended state. The replication controller will respawn uh, containers that have failed or died, and and then it'll it'll try to get to that eventual state. So you have a desired state, and you're you're working towards that. Um, and again, they currently focus on running stateless um, containers such as web servers or memory <coughs> caches. But but have no fear, they will support also all, all, all types of workloads in the future. All right, so. For more information, they have a really good documentation site, uh, what is k8.html. You can go to that website and get more information if you, there's a lot of detail in there. They give a lot of new terms and new, new terminology for their, for their, uh, their model. All right, Kubernetes is difficult to install, but it's not impossible. Um, it's, it's, it's not trivial. We've got, uh, the Kubernetes master node has three services that it has to run the Kube API, uh, Kube Scheduler, and Kube Controller Manager. Um, the Kubernetes nodes themselves, those are the worker nodes, they, they have two different services that you run. Kubelet, which manages the pods and their containers, and then Kube Proxy, which just acts as a simple proxy or, or the load balancer. And, and all of this needs to be connected to etcd, um, and on a cluster of etcd if you want to do it right, and that needs to be set up properly as well. So you need to connect. You need to set up etcd with their RAF protocol, and then and then connect it to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, in many cases, you'll need a software-defined network. Um, currently, uh, we're using Flannel, uh, but there's there's new ones to come later on down the down the road. Um, and, and you should set up TLS certificates if you want secure communications within the cluster. And again, these are, these are not impossible tasks, but you start building the complexity, as you see. Um, and then you've got to figure out how to, how to back it up, how to, how to um, make everything repeatable. Um, it's not a trivial task. So there's many, many different ways to uh, install Kubernetes. You can go to their website. Um, you can do local, local machine solutions that don't scale, but you can do them on your laptop. There's a separate hosted solution. It currently, it's only Google, so you can pay Google to run Google software. Um, there's three turnkey solutions, and two of them boil down to a, you know, curling a Bash script and running it, uh, piping it to Bash. Um, and then, and then there's there's other custom solutions available, but there's there, you know, there's one for Joint, there's one for Rackspace, VMware. There's a lot of other, but they're all custom to that specific cloud. Um, there's also bare metal solutions, and I, I found that last one really interesting, the Kubernetes on Apache Mesos. Um, that one looks you know, really interesting. But come on, are we really going to curl a file and pipe it to bash? Um, that's, not per, that's not production grade, that's not how you install this. Um, we're seeing a lot of modern software distributions doing it this way. They're recommending you, you curl a file and pipe it to bash to install. And, and it's very insecure. and there's no way to verify it came from the right spot. Um, these bash files are usually very small, um, not, not terribly easy to extend or, or, or build upon, right? 
And these scripts have very little operational knowledge. They're basically checking for architecture and trying to get different binaries installed on your system. And no operations team in the world will, will let you curl the bash um, and deploy that on their, on their infrastructure. It's not auditable. Um, it goes against every configuration management principle. And what happens when the new bash file is created, um, what, what happens if, if you get a new bash file, they release one, right when you're setting up a cluster, a large cluster, you can get inconsistent results. So um, they do have some config management scripts to install Kubernetes, but you know, at that point, it's, it's specific to that, that, that particular uh, config management tool. And you, you, do they scale? Do they work in your infrastructure? What do you, you, know, you need to do that. So the right way to do this would be to build Kubernetes yourself um, and put those binaries in the cluster. That way you can do a build, you can move it to deploy, you can test it, and then if it passes the test, it can go to production. Um, your operations team can audit this. This is, this developers can, can, can ensure that they don't break environments this way. And you know, modeling with Juju addresses these concerns. Um, we can deploy the exact same model with all those components that I talked about. etcd cluster, the Kubernetes components, and they're all connected and, and scalable on any cloud, bare metal, on my laptop or on scale with production grade um, quality. All right, so nobody's born with knowing how to install Kubernetes, so this is our journey. <laughs> um, we first had, we had to figure out how to do Kubernetes. And we weren't gonna curl a bash file, to, uh, to, do, to put it bluntly. Um, what we, we, we were doing is we're going to community hangouts. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're reading the documentation. We're, we're on IRC and Slack talking to developers of Kubernetes. We're asking them how we got, how we got it going, and, or how they got it going, and how we can get it going. And we deployed it basically from scratch. But we put all that information into the charm. We put all that operational knowledge, all that knowledge that we learned into the charm that anyone can audit, anyone can extend, anybody can use. Um, and we also wrote the Kubernetes uh, charm in layers, which Mark talked about earlier this week, um, so, that, so that it's easier to extend and it's easier to reuse. Okay, so here's the, all the layers in, on, our, on our Kubernetes offering. Um, they're, they're, they're built with the best practices for each of those layers from, on their specific domain with, without having to reinvent the code each time. And I'm going to talk about each one of them individually here. But if you're, if you're doing Kubernetes and you want to put your, your special sauce on it, you only need to worry about the top level. We've already built the Kubernetes layer on top of Docker, Flannel, TLS, Kubernetes. You just have to worry about putting in that, that extra, extra secret sauce for your application or your, your deployment or your company. Um, these, this, is, this is the uh, way to do um, layer. That's why we're doing it in a layered approach. All right, so the Docker layer obviously installs Docker. Um, you know, Kubernetes deploys Docker containers but it also can be deployed from a Docker container. So obviously the first layer we have here is the, the Docker layer. Um, we've put a lot of code in this layer to make it much easier to interact with Docker workloads. Um, you can, you can uh, manage the containers throughout the whole life cycle of, of the product. So other charms use just this layer. If, you're, if your application is just a Docker layer, you can use this. We have a partner, um, Expeto, um, they make 4G LTE software um, for, phones, for phone applications and things like that. They consumed this Docker layer and, and model their software so that telcos can easily deploy this and modify it, but just using that Docker layer. So, so this Docker layer is well tested. It's vetted by other community members and, and other applications that use this one layer. Now we're moving up the layer. Um, the flannel layer. Uh, currently, Kubernetes recommends the flannel SDN. Um, but going to these community me meetings and things, we know that it will be replaced soon. Um, we're not always going to have flannel. They're, they're going to move to something else, which is why we wrote it as a layer. Um, the, an SDN layer could be easily replaced 
when an upstart, when the upstart or the upstream community commits to that next SDN that we're going to use. And I firmly believe that will be here very soon. But also, other SDNs could write a different layer for the, for the SDN layer and, and put that into a Kubernetes uh, offering. So if you don't want to run Flannel now, you could swap that out and put in uh, <coughs> a, a, you know, a different layer that, that offers other software-defined networks. All right, and one of these, uh, this is, this is the, one of very, a very strong case for layers. Um, to be, uh, to be, to, to, to have secure communication between the nodes in the cluster, TLS, uh, or Kubernetes needs TLS certificates. Um, you can, you can deploy it without, but then you're basically sending unsecured communication between everything. Um, I was working on this, on, on Kubernetes, and I was working on, on how I'm going to do TLS because that's not a trivial task for a whole cluster of, 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 of Kubernetes. <coughs> and my colleague Chuck, who just heard from talking um, just a minute ago, he was working on a, on a charm called Swarm. And so we, we collaborated and built, uh, we built an encapsulation of the TLS um, um, methods and best practices so that for that, for that one domain, we could, have, we could have that same layer in both charms. So the Swarm charm, you can import the TLS layer, and Kubernetes can use it. And it's also a perfect example of um, when we publish the layer, a community member, James Beatty, uh, thank you very much, you, you contributed to that layer right away. So that was, that was a great use, and, and he, brought, he brought his expertise to the layer. And other community members can do that, so this layer can be reused in many different charms. So thank you, James. I really appreciate that. We were really excited to have your contribution there. Awesome. I'm excited to be using the TLS layer. It yeah. It has applications absolutely right. everywhere. Right, right, everywhere. So any, anytime we, yes, a question? Yeah, just if I'm looking on Juju charms of home, there is no TLS layer in layers.yaml. In, in layers.yaml on jujucharms.com? I'm looking at the Kubernetes charm, on charm, jujucharms.com. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't published it yet. I, I have it at the end of the slide. I'll get to it. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Um, all right. So we also ha we also consume the etcd interface layer. Um, we wrote a set of etcd charms that do clustering, and um, etcd is uses a raft protocol to do to to elect a leader and, and make sure that all everybody follows the etcd um, the etcd nodes. But to make that easy to consume, we wrote a layer for, for etcd. And then Kubernetes can just import that layer. And without any code, you're connecting to an etcd layer, uh, or an etcd cluster, excuse me. Um, it's, it's very simple and very straightforward. And, and if your charm needs to connect to etcd, there's other charms that, are, that consume etcd. You can, inter you can implement this layer, just ask for it, and you can get it. Um, and finally, uh, the top layer is the Kubernetes layer. So, <laughs> So if you if you take care of all of the other um, all the other duties below that, you you only have to write the top level Kubernetes code. So we had to write um, we collected all the layers, the Docker, Flannel, etcd, and we assembled the Kubernetes charm. But then we just had to write the Kubernetes bits on top, just the just the <coughs> Kubernetes parts. It makes it much smaller, much easier to maintain, and much easier for people to to you know modify and improve upon. Yes. Are there also uh, replacements for um, single of those uh, uh, layers? Say, can I replace Docker by Rocket or something like that? I think you can. Um, yes. Yes. Has, has it, this been, been done so far? No. So are there it's, it, right now, I just found that they have Docker or the Rocket support. You could, you could, you could put that as a layer. You could have a Rocket layer, and we could build it. There might be some, you know, some some modifications we need to do to the upper, like the Kubernetes part. But there is that is a possibility. Yes, absolutely. Very nice. Very nice. Yes. Uh, so yeah. what's, what's, Good can you question. Explain a bit what's the connection between Kubernetes and HCD here? Yeah, it oh. it uses it as a key value store, but also Flannel currently uses etcd to do the, the to do the networking uh, the software defined networking. So in those two cases, it is required. Right. Yep. Yes. Are these there? Version. Yeah. If something changes in one of the layers that is not compatible with what I want. Right. To happen in my 
We, we don't currently have them versioned. We, we, have, the, we have the ability to do that. Um, if you go to interfaces.juju.solutions, you, you you'll see a version number there, but it, it's currently not tied to the release of the, of the layers. That's a very good point, and yeah. we'll talk about that as, as, a, as going forward, we'll make that a lot better, because you're right. You need to have a specific version that you can point to. Yeah. Yep. But in the current implementation, my understanding is we don't have that. Just to, to touch on that just slightly more. So when we design layers, we design them with the idea that if you publish a layer, you basically publish an interface for communication. So having versions of that just makes it so people start locking to versions. And if people start iterating on top of that, you're still stuck in the old way. So by having layers not versioned explicitly, we kind of start saying you must instill good software practices to even publish a layer. That said, we are building a set of linting tools so that when you build your, you build your charm, you build that charm artifact that can be deployed anywhere. It's almost like an immutable, mutatable object. Uh, you build it once and that object can be deployed everywhere, but that object instills mutations and life cycle. So when you build that charm for the first time, we can easily say, this service is raising these states that you're not responding to now, and you're responding to states that don't exist anywhere else in the stack, you, you may have a mismatch and allow you to, at that build compile time, address those concerns as you would in porting a newer version of a library and compiling it and finding that they've broken compatibility there. So we're not explicitly doing version locking for the express purpose of not to entrench anyone with, with, uh, with maybe bad practices of locking things and not progressing to the next stage so that you're constantly building a charm with an older version and not getting the improvements and the security fixes and the best practices in it. Right. Um, <laughs> right, so there's a, there's a delicate balance there, but you're right. There, there's something that we have to work on in the future and make that an option. And once you build a charm, it's going to use that layer of that built charm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you have a charm in there, there's no mechanism for that, where the layer in your built charm to start automatically changing in your, in your charm you're deploying. And so when you've seen, I don't know if you saw here, but you can do charm build that compiles all layers together. That then goes off to a charm that you can then deploy, and all those versions stay of the layers stay the same in that charm. It's only when you come back and you're doing development again, and you run charm build again, it'll go and pull new layers. Which, to your point, you may want to know, and it does have some interactive and say, you know, is there a new layer? And there's not new layers and new states. Those type of things. But I think it's a good point to call it when you build. It's at that you're not going to be deploying in two weeks later in a charm see your layer automatically change out from underneath you without being active <laughs> tasks. That's a good, that's a good point. Thank you. But we are interested in growing the use cases for that. So if you have a use case that we haven't found yet, we haven't really found a strong, compelling argument that we can't be that can't be discussed and, and resolved in another way. So if you're interested in saying there is a really clear reason for this, come start talking to us on the Juju mailing list. We're we're still evolving layers as we march towards this 2.0 primitive. So it is still a very new concept, but one we're very excited in helping people shape the way that it should be done right by having you guys give us your input and stuff. So those are great questions. All right, so now that we've got the Kubernetes layer, um, what does it look like? This is, this is a cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster. The, the Juju GUI only shows um, you know, one, one, um, one circle for each of the, 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 the charms. But what's going on behind the scenes here, when I create a cluster, there's three etcd nodes running, and there's three Kubernetes nodes running by default. <coughs> if you need to scale that up, um, you, can, you can do that. And I'm prepared to show an example here in a minute. Um, all right, so this is the slide where the layer is. Um, you're right, I have not published that yet. I'm working on that. Um, if you need to go look at all the layers, interfaces.jujusolutions. Um, and if you need to get started, jujucharms.com get started. All right, well, let, me, uh, let me pop into my uh, demo here. So what I've got. Can you go to the last slide again? What's that? No, go back to that last slide with all the okay. stuff. The euro. Yeah. OK, hang on. The... There we go. Oh, all right. All right. So what we've 
we've got here is this is okay. Yep. So this is, a, this is the Juju status screen of a Kubernetes cluster running on Amazon right now. Um, I deployed this model from our, what we call a bundle file. Um, and you can see the, the, the etcd parts here. There are three, indeed three units running. Uh, there's the Juju GUI running. And uh, Kubernetes has three units it, it's itself as well. Um, I can pop over here and we can show you the, the GUI. This is a nice representation of the model. Um, Again, you can click on it here. You can see that there are three services, but there are seven machines. So if I click on uh, Kubernetes, you can see that the units, you can see each one of those, right? And then you can, you can, you can do operations on those. You can get their public, private addresses, things like that. Um, since this is Amazon, um, I've, I've got it running also on my laptop. So if I switch to this tab, this is the exact same model uh, running on my laptop. I scaled it up one, so there is three services but nine machines. And this, I deployed this on my laptop into a KVM, uh, KVM containers, or KVM machines. So I can show you those here, um, all those nodes running. We have virtual machine one through eight. Um, the, the, and I can switch this, so if I hit control C, juju switch KVM. Uh, let's just watch the status again. <coughs> so again, this one has four Kubernetes containers because I, I scaled this up one. So you can scale it up another by saying, Juju add unit Kubernetes. <coughs> and what that's going to do is Juju's going to add a machine that's going to. Can I switch back to the other yep. screen? Yep. So that. So you'll see here that, that Juju has added a, a, a ninth, uh, another machine here. It's waiting for the, or the uh, initialization to finish. What's happening is Juju's getting, or Ubuntu's getting installed. We're going to have the Kubernetes the Docker, the Kubernetes, the flannel get installed. And then it will make a relation to etcd, and it'll add itself to the cluster. It'll, it'll tell all its peers, hey, I'm here. And oh, and by the way, I need TLS certificates. So give me a, give me a signed certificate and, and add me to the cluster, please. So to show that, let's OK, on this one here. Um, I just SSH'd to the uh, etcd, uh, the etcd zero node, okay? etcd ctl uh, cluster health. etcd ctl. etcd. Yeah, etcd, thank you. All right. Almost. All right, so that, again, you get, you get the IP addresses, you say, okay, the cluster is healthy. We'll go to the next one. Um, I can go to Kubernetes here and say kube control get pods. All right, now you only see that we have three. Four. Wait, there's four. Four, yeah. Is it, oh, yeah, it's four because I scaled up one before this demo. It's still working on the fifth one, okay? Yeah. So the fifth one, I, I can show you that it's still, it's still working on it. It's uh, installing the flannel networking right now, currently. So, oh, it's, Oh, waiting for okay, you're right. It it will take a minute. It's it's going through a slow internet for the for the uh, for the university. But but just by switching your your just by switching your, your, your environment, your cloud environment, you can deploy that same model, that same production grade Kubernetes to any of the clouds, to to GCE, to Amazon, to my laptop. And and with Kubernetes you get uh, you know resiliency. You can kill the kill those uh, those nodes and they'll move the the containers off and start them up on other nodes. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, 
Is there is there any questions? Anybody have questions? Yes. Can you show us the Kubernetes charm? How does it actually look like? Yes. If I want to say uh, start uh, two um, replication controllers and four pods or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly can. Yep. Let's do that. Okay. So. So. The build charm or the layers? Layers. Okay. To reactive, okay, all the code is is, is is within this k8s uh, .py. Um, okay. Three hundred twenty lines of code. Twenty one. Yeah. So much. This doesn't show very well here, but much like what Chuck showed you. Um, and we're using the reactive uh, framework here with layers. If uh, this is a hook, config change, so when config change is called. Um, some of the interesting bits are down here. So, so when, when TLS certificates are available, and when, uh, when we don't have the K8 certificate available, do this. So you're going to say, we have, the, we have the certificates available. We're going to copy them to the, where Kubernetes will expect it to find them, right? That's just, just the Kubernetes bits. It's not, uh, we don't have to create the certificates. We say when, whenever it gets sent to us, it's okay they're available, we copy it to the right directory. And that directory is uh, SRV Kubernetes. Um, when the client certificate's available, we'll just, we'll make that directory, we'll copy them to the uh, appropriate directory, again, SRV Kubernetes. Um, Certificate available. Uh, certificate authority. So if the certificate authority is available, we're gonna we're gonna take the, the certificate authority and install that on this system. And there's some messaging bits in here. Sky DNS. When Docker is available, uh, we just put out a message that we're waiting for a relation to etcd because at that point we can run Kubernetes. But when etcd is available and we have uh, the certificate available, then we can start. Uh, Kubernetes, and we're using some some uh, this compose class from the Docker layer that helps us easily control uh, the Docker containers. And then, uh, so you can get uh, there's a, there's a way that you can get the kube, kube control binary, so you can control that, and uh, we package up the the CA cert and the key there, so you can you can run it from your client. We start C advisor, things like that, and then these are utility methods that they don't have anything to do with reactors. So. Are there any questions? Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>